I'd like to welcome you all to our industry panel this morning on government and higher education. Uh, my name is Tim Stahl. I'm the uh, Senior Director of Architecture here at Decisions. Uh, long time viewer, first time caller, right? Have first presentation of the day. Um, been with Decisions about four years, but my background is actually in higher ed. Uh, about 20 years uh, between two different institutions, running IT shops, doing business analysis, writing custom code setting up parking meters, going and uh, doing game day operations. You know, it's higher education, you kind of get a little bit of everything, right? Um, I'd like to go ahead and introduce our panel. I'll start, I'll start with how the pictures are, not how they're seated. Uh, April, if you want to start, give a little um, introduction. Hey, good morning. My name's April Burke. I'm a communication and engagement strategist in the office of the Vice President for Business, business and Finance at Georgia Southern University. Cool. Uh, and Martin. I'm Martin Kolick. I'm from New York University. I'm a project lead which doesn't say a lot, but I'm more of a systems engineer, so I'll just say that's what I do. Awesome, and Joe. And, and I'm Joe Nasavich. I work at the University of Virginia, so wahoo wah. Um, <laughs> Sunday was graduation. I walked the lawn for the very first time. Uh, I'm a web developer there. I've been using Decisions for about three or four years, and I've been at the university as the web developer for the School of Nursing for about seven or eight years. I've lost count. Sounds good, sounds good. Um, what we'll do today is we have uh, some questions uh, prepared that we're gonna go through and we'll kind of talk, uh, get some conversations going. Uh, if at any time you have questions or you have comments, things like that, please feel free, raise your hand, we'll call in and we'll say, hello, how are you? Uh, get, let you introduce yourself and then you know, go ahead and ask that question. But um, I think without further ado, what I'll do is go ahead and move this into our kind of list here that we've got going. Um, I kind of like to start this with, we know where you're from, uh, we know what your roles are, but maybe if each one of you in turn uh, would like to just say, you know, what do you use decisions for currently? You know, high level, right? Um, maybe just start with a, one of your, your, the projects that you are really proud of that are uh, in our product. I'll start. Um, <laughs> so uh, I'm, I'm going to start with actually uh, just a comment about the University of Virginia. Um, it, it seems like a behemoth of a school because there are, you know, I forget, 20 or 40,000 undergraduates. Um, but it's a federated system. So our IT is central, and they provide some services, email, uh, perimeter firewall, that sort of things, common functionality. But each school, each major department, fends for itself as far as IT. Um, and this has, for good reason, because a local IT shop is going to be more responsive to the needs of that particular school. But the problem is um, the enterprise architecture is almost non-existent because each school, each department is sort of fending for itself. It's very siloed. Uh, the data is very siloed. I see a lot of people shaking their heads. They agree. Um, very familiar problem. So where we're using decisions is getting some of that data from these various sources of truth, these databases that we do not control, um, and then getting them into our systems so that we can manipulate them. Um, our biggest use case is for groups management. <clears throat> um, and what we do is um, every semester, we onboard several hundred students. Uh, we offboard several other hundred students. Uh, students move up from uh, first year students to second year students. Second years become third years. Uh, graduate first years become graduate second years, et cetera. Um, and as that changes, they change email lists. Um, their permissions change. Um, they can use the glucometer on the fourth floor now, but they couldn't last year. Um, and you can imagine what that, what that was like uh, prior to automating. For sure. <laughs> yeah, for sure. Um, April. <laughs> Um, so I know that my title is probably unique, um, one that you don't hear about a lot in higher ed. Um, when you think about the structure of a university, um, we're our own ecosystem. So anything that you can imagine that a city or mun municipality has, we have in the, um, in the higher ed sphere. Um, so business and finance, we have basically everything that doesn't happen in the classroom. Um, so if you think about printing and postal, auxiliaries from dining to retail shops, um, IT, physical plant, um, finance, payroll, anything you can think of. Um, and what I do is um, I work to 
engage people and measure impact and say, how can we add to the experience outside of the classroom? Um, if I was talking to my team, I would <laughs> tell them that what we do is the most important thing because I don't think that students come to a traditional campus for what happens in the classroom. Um, I think that they come for the experience and, and we in business and finance have the ability to impact their lives um, in a very different way than they're impacted in the classroom. Um, and no code platforms allow us to do that in a really agile way um, so that we can give people personal experiences. Um, we can deploy, you know, new apps, new forms, new dashboards very rapidly um, just to make sure we're engaging people where they are. Um, if I think about impact, um, we, we have a lot of things going on in decisions. We have dashboards, we have forms, um, but if I really think about that impact to the student, I think one of our most impactful projects has been the military transfer credit site. Um, we're a military friendly university um, and what that military transfer credit site allows students to do is if you are in the Army or you are in the Navy, um, you can go to this site and basically it's doing transfer articulation to tell you if you were, you know, enlisted for this many years or if this was your MOS, these are the credits that you could come to us with and you've already have that completed. Um, so it's, you know, it's engaging them where they are and really giving them I guess a sense of excitement, progress, that kind of thing um, to go ahead and get enrolled. Awesome, awesome. So us at NYU are federated also. Um, we have campuses and sites all around the world from Abu Dhabi, Shanghai to Tel Aviv and New York City, Washington DC, Los Angeles. Uh, and we use decisions for, to determine the types of badge that a university affiliated person gets. So I as an employee get a purple badge it has gold text on it. Uh, I'm in New York City, so my site and my template is New York City. Uh, if I was in, in Shanghai or Prague or whatever, it would be different. I would, the calculations for the type of template I would get would be different. Uh, it also determines the type of end date that I get as an employee. How many years in the future do I have to go and get a new badge? Uh, if I'm terminated, when does that get turned off? What type of access do I get as an employee to what buildings are on campus? Uh, so that's integrated also to our access control system, not just into the badging system, but to the access control to unlock the doors with the ID card. So it'll assign several access levels that are broad access levels for students, like the library, the student center. Uh, we just went live two weeks ago. It's going pretty good. Obviously, there's some issues. Predominant issues are data discrepancies. Data is not how we expect it. So that's where we have the most work to do now. And I would say, data discrepancies get us all, all the time. Um, especially when you're talking about onboarding students, onboarding faculty and staff, where are they located? Did HR input it right? Did it come from the student information system right? So is that something, you know, you're integrated fully with those various systems to pull that data? Like, I guess I'm, I'm kind of curious, you know, is that a common practice you see? So we have lots of systems that NYU do do all kinds of different things. So we have our warehouse that brings in all the data from the SIS system, Workday for employees, and SailPoint, which is their affiliate system. It brings that data and, and kind of joins them one row per person, table view for decisions to consume. Um, there's other tables that are associated, which uh, are strictly from HR, for instance, which have the start and end dates for certain positions. Uh, sale point, you also get a separate data set which Decisions has access to the start and end date for affiliates. So as an affiliate, as a contract, maybe a cleaning crew or the wiring crew, um, they have access for different amounts of time. They're an affiliate, they're not an employee, they're not a student, so they're, they're an affiliate system. Uh, so they have different start and end dates as opposed to everybody else. Um, we do also consume the term data from SIS, but that is all kind of flattened out for us in, in the data warehouse. So there's already some logic that is present there, but we don't, we already had the experience of having the logic and the data tied together, and that's why we chose decisions and we went with it because we wanted to separate the business layer with the, uh, the uh, oh my goodness, uh, the logic layer and the business layer, basically. Absolutely. So, uh, so it's kind of interesting because we have had very similar systems where we have a student information system, we have a workday, and we're pulling in employee data, but we're actually importing our data. Okay. We don't have direct access because I mentioned these little fiefdoms before. <laughs> um, so we, we have to ask Mother May I, 
to get the data. So we use Boomi to, to download the data, do the data transformations. We then write it to our own SQL databases, which then we can manipulate. So we basically have a feed that runs uh, several times a day to get those updates. Interesting. Yeah, it's, that's a, it, it's interesting. I've seen, in higher ed, I've seen it go both ways, right? Where, it, and even, even in my past experience, I've had it at the same institution work two different ways, depending on what system you're trying to access, what system you're trying to send data to, of course, it, it gets even hairier. So that's, it, it's fascinating where, you know, one of the, the key tenants to security to FERPA to me would be one system source of truth pull from there. But it's interesting because of the, you know, the nature of government, the nature of bureaucracy, you do end up with the, uh, the little fiefdoms and it kind of, uh, you know, that whole point of keep it all in one spot kind of goes out the window um, due to control or, or whatever you'd like to call it. Um, NYU recently has spent a, a tremendous amount of time and effort in actually combining all of the systems together and putting governance in front of it. So we have MuleSoft as the system that kind of transfers the data for us. Mm -hmm. Then we have uh, other governance tools which actually do the governance, but this is all recent in the past two, three years. It's really accelerated accelerated for uh, the reason you said privacy concerns interesting interesting well what and, and this is this is for any anybody to take you know what do you think you know going off of this, some of the most pressing technology problems are that are coming up in in higher ed um, you know just in the next couple of years even things that you're seeing coming up and what do you think like a, a platform like ours like decisions could do to help you you know maybe work through some of those issues or get get uh, you know successful implementations in in play um, I would say the disparate systems are are the issue because you know our customers are coming to us and they're looking for a seamless user experience um, where you're not going to have that with those disparate systems and what we're using decisions for is to basically you know give us that front end to allow us to create something a, a UI that our users expect to see that's consistent across all platforms um, across these disparate systems. Interesting. Interesting. Um, I would I would add that you know plus one for that for you, uh, <laughs> but uh, technical debt is probably an uh, issue that probably I think I see heads not bobbing again. Um, <laughs> you know we have these old legacy ASP.NET uh, custom code that was written somewhere in the late 90s, um, so they are extremely well documented um, and crystal clear and very easy to transmit. Not. Okay? They are not documented at all. You probably all run into this. We have no idea what they do. Um, that groups management thing I, I had mentioned before was a rewrite of something that we had no idea how it worked. It didn't always work. Uh, the decision stuff worked. Um, and we were able to turn it around very, very quickly. Uh, making a change, super easy. Not quite self-documenting, but it's pretty close. So that, that's where decisions comes in. Um, sure. And where I'm most impressed is that um, I can develop a system, I'm not gonna say in two days, but in five days I can have a, a full up system, fully documented, working, debugged, unit test, integration tested, done in one week. Same thing would have taken me two or three months to do an ASP.NET or something like that. Oh, very cool. Yeah, that's, that's good, good to know. Um, uh, that's, uh, that's what a lot of the adoption we've seen too, uh, especially related to higher ed and government is the fact that somebody can get a system like this and once they're up to speed, right, you know, and understand how it works, how the connections are made, you start seeing other things that are out there that you can use the platform for, right? You know, you get comfortable writing a report and it's like, oh, okay, I can now put this on a page and expose this to, you know, institution administration, students, fac staff, what, what have you. Um, so it's, it's interesting to hear that, actually. Um, what do you think, uh, you know, on that point, how do you think that these kind of platforms could help maybe empower more non-technical staff, you know, to have a, a say in this or have, you know, some, some points where they could develop things or, or bring, you know, value to the table uh, to, to the population? Yeah, so we've been um, in decisions for about three or four years. That is something that we're, we're looking at now. Um, traditionally, we've had um, our business analysts who are more of a technical role in our IT shop um, working in decisions, and, and they are aligned with the business units. Um, you know, the, the model for that is, 
unique in that it allows, instead of IT being a utility, you know, it allows our business analysts to come alongside them and be a partner and offer advice and um, quickly deploy applications as needed. Um, one of the things we're looking at doing is establishing those guardrails so that people in those business units can, you know, within reason, um, you know, create and deploy applications and forms and things like that on their own. And it really just empowers them, um, you know, the, the speed to speed to deployment, right, um, allows them to get those things out there and kind of take control of their own destiny. Pretty cool. Pretty cool. Yeah, Martin? So, so I think for us, the biggest problem at the university space, to your previous question, is money. Uh, in that there's sure. never enough of it, right? So we don't typically have good business requirements because we don't have business analysts on every project. We don't typically have good project plans because there's always a shortage of project plans and an overwhelming amount of projects to do. So for those reasons, having decisions will help us develop things and make changes uh, quickly. So even though it took us two plus years of development and decisions to get where we are now, uh, we didn't have requirements to go off of, so we were able to build you know, the baseline system. They were like, oh wait, but we're missing data. So then we added a flow, we added more data to bring in, then we added more data, another table, and then we just continued iterating until we were like, okay, we're 85, 90, 95% there, eventually we got to 95, and we were able to actually just go live with a hard cutover, like a waterfall style cutover, in an agile project. So that was really where the, the benefit came to us. And I'll, I'll say for us, so we, we're at the School of Nursing. Um, nurses are, are very good at nursing. Uh, they're not very good at IT. Um, so we really do not uh, enable our users to do development. Uh, where I see us adding value is sort of enhancing those partnerships where we can sit down with them and uh, say, how can we help you? And turning that around so quickly and saying a week later, here's, here's what you asked for. Is this what you want? And they'll say yes, or they'll say no, that's not quite what we wanted, and we'll iterate again, and we can do that so fast, which, we, like I said, we can't do that in a traditional uh, programming language. So uh, that's where I see it adding value. Interesting. For us also, we don't have in-house developers. We are buy before you build shop, so we, <laughs> We, we typically buy everything rather than build and spend the money because then you incur a lot of technical debt and we've been there so we've tried to avoid that now. Uh, and so it allows us to have an offshore team that does development for us and then we as power users can look at the rules, we can visually see the logic and be able to say no that's wrong, this has to change. Uh, so that's been another tremendous opportunity for us. No, that's cool. And it, it's really interesting too. And, and when you kind of dive into the waterfall versus agile and be able to iterate quickly, it's, it's interesting. It's the same method we use internally at Decisions. And, and when we're working with a client um, to actually build something out, like we're, we're working with some of the folks in this room actually, um, where we'll come in, you know, I run the architecture team, I see a couple of my other architects in the room, um, we'll actually come in and, and help offload the business analysis part, but be able to do the same thing where we kind of have more of a we call it an agile RTM, but kind of a waterfall uh, deliverable out of project management that gives a setup of all the requirements, but we're able to use the agile method to build it, right? We can come to you in a week and say, hey, here's the first part of it. Are, are, we, are we hitting the mark or have we, are we way off? Um, and able to, to iterate on it. And I know even from, you know, the, 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 uh, the glaring secret here was I used to work at Georgia Southern and actually bought decisions as a client uh, before joining the team. And I know that, that that's how, you know, I did, helped with some of the initial success with the platform was being able to iterate very, very quickly. Um, you know, stand up a project, you know, we had business and finance coming to us and say, we have, you know, an enrollment decline. We have students who are gonna fall off the rolls because they haven't, you know, paid their, paid their tuition for the, for the semester. How can you help? And it was, well, let's spin up a real quick uh, form that they can go into the portal and fill out their information and say, help, I can pay, but I can't pay for two weeks. Like, you know, I'm getting there, my parents are helping me out, or the bank loan's coming through, or whatever the reason is, 
we could have that go through an automated approval process and then flow right into the student information system. And it was something we were able to turn around very, very quickly, bare bones. Now, mind you, it was bare bones. <laughs> but it, it, it solved the problem and immediately, it was the first thing we did in the platform, and we were immediately able to show value to the student community and, and to, the, to my bosses at the time, which really helped me out. Um, but uh, we were able to show that value and, and again, continue to iterate on it. And I know every year it gets better, it gets better, it gets better. Um, so that, that was one thing. I don't know that it's 100% unique to higher ed, but it really, it really showed me the value early on of, of no code. Um, <clears throat> you know, I guess, you know, and, and off of that, you know, do you all have any, any thoughts on how no code could, you know, platforms like this, some of the things we've been talking about, could improve student engagement or student success or student outcomes related to you know, your particular areas within the universities? Yeah, I mean, that's something that I'm passionate about and I've talked about a little bit here today. Um, it's really meeting customers where they are and, and in a way that they expect to be engaged. Um, Decisions has allowed us, like I said, to create some consistency um, across disparate systems so that whether they're looking for housing or looking for a dining plan or, you know, trying to find out um, when our retail shops are open, um, they're finding information in a way that they expect to find it. Um, that user experience is very important when you think about Gen Z and how they're coming to us and how they interact with everything in the world. Um, they don't expect higher ed to be different, and it has been different for a really long time. Um, there's a lot of silos. There's a lot of information that we know that we expect people to know but they don't know um, and so you know being able to deploy rapid forms and um, applications and dashboards and things like that just just help us speed everything up and deliver it in a way that our customers expect to receive it yeah I'll give you a, a concrete example uh, we're talking about digitization of things like there we still have paper forms uh, so COVID happened I don't know if everybody remembers COVID. Um, so it was, uh, it was not practical for students to come in and have a form and have a, their advisor sign the form and then the advisor's department chair and then the dean to sign things like that. So uh, we took advantage of the DocuSign module. Um, mm -hmm. I, I think we were one of the earliest people to use it. I, at times I felt we were beta testers. So, <laughs> but anyway, we're not it works. Say that, but. <laughs> it works. <laughs> um, but uh, so we do that, and we we send out thousands of forms. Uh, we have nursing students that are with patients. Uh, they have to uh, sign acknowledgement forms that they can contract a deadly disease, um, and we have to have that on file, and we have to have it in a legal, legally signed form, and we have to keep it for I don't know how many years we have to keep it, but for a long time. So we're able to do all that in an automated fashion. We can track it with decisions to see that they actually signed it and then send reminders on a daily basis because we really want them to sign it um, so that they continue to get the reminders until they sign it. And if they don't, it goes up to our academic deans who then start making phone calls. That's how important it is that we have these forms. So in that sense, it's a lot easier for them because they don't have to actually sign, download a form, bring it in. Uh, we now have remote students who never stepped foot on campus. Uh, they're not going to fill out a paper form. No, oh, that's, that's, that's fascinating. And it's, it's something that we're seeing. We saw a lot of through the COVID years were, you know, the forced digitization of paper-based, all-in-people's-heads processes. Because, um, of course, everybody has a system that stores a, um, you know, department to department chair to dean to director to... You know, no, it doesn't exist. It's all in everybody's head. Um, or the, uh, you know, the paper processes that, that, you know, it's, it's, you know, student A fills out this form and it's like, well, what do I do next? Well, you should know you have to go get it signed by your faculty. Oh, okay. The, get, get, yeah, exactly, exactly. No, that's, that's a, that was like kind of a, a quick win way I've seen uh, people really starting to add, you know, provide value through, through platforms like this. So it's, it's, it's fascinating to hear it. that's consistent across the board there. Um, you know, we touched on this a little bit earlier, but I'm curious, um, related to tech debt, you know, we were talking about that briefly. How do you think a platform like this, uh, a no-code platform like this would help you, you know, kind of solve or, or maybe uh, not have as much tech debt, um, you know, as, as you move forward uh, or as you build new projects or, or have new um, things that you're building for people? 
Um, well, I gave an example of our groups management. I mean, that's a, that's a typical example. I think it's not unique to higher ed or anybody else in that you have these older systems built with older technology and it's undocumented. The person that wrote it is long gone. Uh, and we have, and so we, so we, you know, we can turn around these systems, we can reevaluate them, uh, fix the things that weren't quite right to start and, and put it on a modern platform that we think is gonna be around for a long, long time. And we can do it quickly. Very cool. So that, that's the biggest advantage I see. For us, we eliminated 30 years of technical debt by going to decisions. We replaced the identity management system with SailPoint. At the same time, all the rules were in our identity, old identity system. So uh, by going to decisions, all that technical debt was able to be erased. If without the rules engine, we, we had no place to put, the, to, put the, uh, to put the rules. The card printing system that promised for many years that they're gonna have the business rule module never delivered. So this was our saving grace. And had we relied on them, um, we would have been in, in more technical debt that they had owned now. Not our technical debt, but still, we were still incurring the punishment for their technical debt. So that really, um, it really saved us. <laughs> I say, yeah, the card, the card and transaction platforms have been promising a lot for a long time. <laughs> I know that well. Uh, what they do is they actually just change names every couple of years. It's kind of like the apartment complexes around the campus. Um, you know, what it becomes, one is Blackboard and then it's Transact, one becomes Atrium, one becomes Seaboard. Anyway, I, I could get on. We, we were talking before this, and that was kind of my background, so I could go on a platform about that for an hour. Um, I will save you all from that. The, I, I guess, you know, kind of, kind of wrapping up, we're actually coming up on time. It, this went by very quickly. Um, what's next? So when you look at your platform, you look at your systems, you look at what you have across the university, what's next? What, what do you see as maybe the next thing you tackle or what do you see as a challenge maybe coming up in the next year or two that, that you think this might help you with? Um, so for us, I, I feel like we're becoming very mature in our um, decisions deployment. Um, we have probably about 130 forms, dashboards, applications. Um, and probably 20 more in the queue that we want to finish before July. Um, I think one of the things that we kind of didn't plan for was success. Um, <laughs> my background is in journalism, and I interviewed a very successful business owner one time and asked him, what advice would you give to other business owners? And he said, plan for success. Um, you know, you have to budget for it. You have to make a plan to be successful. Um, and I don't know that we planned on how quickly our users would adopt it uh, and how quickly they would want all of their forms pushed um, into an automated platform. Um, now everybody wants it and we have a certain number of business analysts that build in the platform and those people, um, you know, they're, they're working trying to build in these platforms for their business units, um, but it's also being adopted across the USG and so my colleague is here from Kennesaw um, and we want to work with them to help them. You know, that's, that's something we do in higher ed is exchange of information. Um, so it's, it's teaching and sharing, um, not only with people inside the university system, but within our own institution. I mentioned that we're trying to, um, within reason, you know, give our business units certain guardrails so that they are empowered to build their own things, um, but you have to teach them. Um, the other thing about decisions, and um, Will Pedersen is not in here, but he and I have talked at length about this, and, you know, in decisions, you can do just about anything, but you don't know what you don't know. You know, <laughs> um, there are a lot of things that, you know, we're, we're constantly refining our software list and, and saying where can we cut costs. Um, if you read the Atlanta Journal-Constitution, you'll know that um, education budgets are being cut in Georgia. And so one of the first things that people go to is their IT shop, where can we cut software costs? Um, a lot of things can be done in decisions, but we don't necessarily know how to do it um, if you haven't ever done it. Um, so that's, I think the planning for success, the planning for long-term training and education, um, and then just, you know, resource planning is, is huge for us. I think that's where we'll go next is saying, you know, how do we scale this? How do we get bigger? How do we allow more people to work in the platform? Awesome. So we planned for success on our team, but similarly, we did not plan on success university-wide. So now that we have success on our team, how can we share it with other departments 
and perhaps eliminate other software that is duplicate. However, also at the same time, not step on the toes of any of the other software either, because we can do just about anything in decisions. Doesn't mean we should. So I think we have to be very careful in choosing what we put into decisions uh, while maintaining the benefit um, without blowing up and uh, eliminating things that were perhaps working. Yeah, I, I think for, for us what's next is uh, we're, we're moving to the cloud uh, somewhat belatedly. All of our databases and things like that are uh, on-premises and we are slowly moving to uh, Azure, uh, SQL Azure, Azure SQL, I forget which way you say it. Um, and uh, I think you sort of mentioned it already, training, but we need to train staff who can use decisions and cloud-based technologies because we don't have that type of skill set in-house yet. So we're looking for people that know how to use decisions. So if anybody wants to work at a wonderful university, <laughs> Anybody would like to work at uh, UVA, um, please feel free to reach out, Joe. Yeah. Uh, <laughs> no, I, I think that's interesting. You know, you brought up the point of, you know, could you build it in decisions? Yes. Should you? No. Could you build a card game in decisions? Yes. Should you? Yes. <laughs> <laughs> I say that we actually, Josiah has built a game in, in the platform. I think, um, I think John has, uh, uh, from uh, the guy from Minnesota, has a thing where he does his uh, football pools. His fantasy decisions. football, yeah. yes. Yeah. So <laughs> yeah, he's got a whole fantasy football you league. You can dream uh, it, you can build uh, it. At yeah. the very beginning of COVID, we built a um, conference called Bingo in decisions. Oh gosh, I forgot about so, that yes. one. <laughs> I think I still have that project around somewhere. <laughs> I'll just say it was hilarious to be on conference calls and people were wondering why I'm sitting there giggling with my decision studio up and then I'd share my screen and they go, you are a child. <laughs> uh, one thing I'd love to do is uh, actually build a, an app, you know, and I don't know that you can do it in decisions, but I certainly have the back end of it, which is uh, we jokingly call the School of Nursing the School of Free Food. So there are constantly emails about free food in conference room, whatever, which is super annoying if you don't want free food. But if we could put it on an app so you'll just get an alert on your app, that would be so much better. <laughs> so any closing thoughts or things that, that I hadn't asked that you wanted to share today or questions from anybody in the, in the room there? Or? Any questions? I had a question. How much networking are you doing internally with some of your colleagues and other departments so the question was, how much networking are we doing with other departments uh, to, to promote the use of decisions? Not as much as we should. We really need to blow our own horn. Uh, we've had some successes that uh, we, don't, we don't advertise. Um, that said, um, I'm in the School of Nursing. I have friends in other schools whom I've said, this is the greatest thing since sliced bread. You really need to try it. And people are busy. Uh, they, I, I'm going to keep trying, but uh, uh, to get other departments to, to adopt it will take, you know, some some face-to-face -face meetings and stuff, and maybe some demos and things like that. Yeah, I'm just thinking out loud because I uh, I'm from academic medicine also, and I just think about our process improvement teams and some of our quality teams that are, you know, still stuck in analysis paralysis and spreadsheets. And yes. Stuff. Yeah. Or if you're really lucky. That'll, that'll be oh, our next no. app is, is, is replacing some spreadsheets that are, we don't know where, um, onto uh, an Azure database uh, that everybody can access and will be consistent. Awesome. Yeah, for us it's a lot. I mean, I, I mentioned <clears throat> that our structure is, um, we've strategically aligned business analysts from our IT shop with the different areas of the university for specifically that reason, um, just to make sure that, you know, they're constantly there. They're at those departmental meetings. They're a part of every conversation so that they can offer those solutions and be that business partner. And for us at NYU, um, similarly, people are busy and they don't want to touch another tool unless they truly have a need. So I think finding the, the need in the university is where you're really going to get the benefit. and. Uh, uh, so that's going to be our focus, but again, we have to ensure that the structure as to how we deploy decisions, how we use it, is there. We don't have developers in-house, so if we're doing outsource development, what do, should our projects look like? Uh, what should the naming convention look like? So a person that is working for IT as a project, uh, project lead can look at it and see it. So 
having those governance processes in place, uh, I think, is our first step. Great. Anybody else? All right. Oh, please. Yeah, hi, I'm Greg. I'm on the training team for Decisions. And I'm just curious, beyond you actually using Decisions in your environments, are students learning about what you're doing in any way, or faculty learning uh, how you're implementing Decisions? No. <laughs> yeah, I, I think he. I think he got it for all of us. Um, hopefully, it's transparent to them. Um, as the end user of most of our services, um, hopefully they experience a better experience. But they, you know, we don't want them to see the man behind the curtain, that kind of thing. We we don't want them to have to think about that. Ideally, uh, it's probably a, the short answer is no, but. Um, I'll share a story. Um, I, because we have such a federated system, we actually have a very small IT shop. Uh, we only have five people in our shop, uh, which means that I am the chief cook and bottle washer when it comes to the website, including decisions. So we don't have a separate database administrator. We, we have a system administrator, but I administer the, the system. So I do the upgrades. So when I take the system down, I send an email to everyone to say that decisions will be down and these apps will not work for the next six hours. Um, and I get emails back saying, I don't care. <laughs> <laughs> so I, I think I'm just spamming people. <laughs> awesome. Yeah, as I say, as, as, as a note, you know, to, to touch off April, what you said, you know, <clears throat> um, there's a, a process at Southern by which when a student uh, is accepted to the university, it was a traditional paper process, right? It was, they would print out the acceptance letter, somebody would sign it, somebody would stuff an envelope, somebody would write their address on, somebody would take it to the post office. And then the student would get it in four to six weeks. <laughs> um, and one of the processes we put in place early on is that's actually done in decisions now. So as soon as the decision is made in the SIS, um, flag trips, you're all of a sudden accepted, accepted equals yes, and if the student logs into their uh, admissions acceptance uh, portal, they're actually able to see in real time that they've been accepted. Decisions actually builds the uh, acceptance letter now in real time for them, creates a PDF, here you go. Are you in this college, are you in this school? Welcome to Decisions, they get a, a really you, cool video. Do you use ChatGBT to generate the letter? I should okay. have. <laughs> <Yeah>. <laughs> Definitely should have. Um, Cool. Well, uh, I will say, everybody, thank you, panel. Um, thank you for uh, joining us today, sharing your insights. Um, we are right at time, though. Thank you so much. A hand for our panel, please.